Welcome, but I'm here with Penny Janowski at her Lake Cabin here in Lake Weir. And uh, I see, Penny, you're wearing your uh, garnet and gold colors today. Uh, anything you want to tell us about your garnet and gold colors? I have a lot to tell you about my garnet and gold colors, PL. I, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit before the garnet and gold. It was red and white at Crestview High School. Actually, um, I got interested in baton twirling and music uh, because my mother had been in high school band and um, she was a piano player. So I started taking piano when I was eight years old. And interestingly enough, I saw a young lady teaching baton twirling down my street. And actually I was about 10 then, 10 or 11. And I went down and asked how you took lessons. And she said, well, you have to have a quarter. So I went back home and got a quarter, paid her that, and started taking baton. And then when I got in the seventh grade, uh, my mother was a big band person. So my brother started playing trumpet the year before, and I started playing clarinet. And then I asked, would it be possible to try out for majorette in the seventh grade because Crestview High School was seventh grade through 12th. And they said, sure. So with my little bit of basic knowledge, I tried out, managed to make it. So then my mom said, well, if you're going to do that, you've got to do it better than you're doing it now. So she drove me to Pensacola, where the Pensacola High School band director's wife taught baton twirling. And also, she said, I, I had been taking dancing, and so you need to get better in all this if you're going to really do this. That all went great. I became the acrobatic majorette because most of the girls were a little older, bigger. Then in the 10th grade, a great thing happened to Crestview High School. They bought a bassoon. So our band director, named Dean Mann, marvelous human being, decided that Penny would play the bassoon. Now, when we learned clarinet, we had the little beginner book and all, but this he just gave me a fingering chart and said, now you need to really learn this fingering. Well, that was a little bit stressful. Luckily, I only played the bassoon during spring because in fall I, I marched as a majorette. Well, in the uh, 12th grade, uh, and now I'm going to go back to something. In the 8th grade, Dean Mann had graduated from Auburn. He decided to take practically the whole band to band camp. Now, we loved band camp. I especially loved it. They put you out there with all these baton twirlers, and then we only had like six in my town and the few that took lessons. And uh, they said, everybody twirl as hard as you could and as much as you can. And when it was all over, they, they came over there and said, well, you win. You, you, and I'm, me win? Okay. <laughs> And you get to come back to camp free next year. Oh, that was a big deal back in the day. So I went back the next year, and it was then that I thought, I'm coming here to college, because the college majorettes were the teachers. Then I became a senior, and my dad said, oh, no, we're not playing out-of-state tuition. You're going down the road to Tallahassee, where your mother went to school. And, and I tried out and made majorette there. In the meantime, in the 10th grade, I started teaching baton in my front yard. And I'm not kidding you when I say every little girl in town came to teach baton, to take baton. And I loved that. That's kind of when I got the, the love of teaching because they liked it so much. We had a really good time. And Dean Mann let them march for a pregame. It was about 40 of them. And uh, so that's kind of how I got into teaching. Then I when I made Majorette at FSU, something that was pivotal pivotal in my life was when D uh, Dr. Manley R. Wickham, our band director, came to the first Majorette practice, and we're all sitting down on the ground, and he said, can anybody here type? Well, I looked all around, and I just finished two years of typing. I knew how to type. Nobody raised their hand. So I raised my hand, and he said, and what's your name? I said, Penny. He said, I'm MacArthur. He said, well, good. Could you come to the band office tomorrow next time and type a letter for me? I said, I'll be glad to. And the result of me typing that letter, I worked in there for the next four years, three days a week, for like an hour at 8 in the morning, and uh, really got to know Brownie and Charlie and everybody in the School of Music really well because I was not a music major. And... Um, Along with making a majorette that year, I had tried out for the concert band. 
Mind you, I did not say the symphonic band, but concert band. And that was a great experience until I played on a wrist. Now, Robert Brannagle was the director. When that happened, I've never seen anybody laugh so hard in my life. And he just couldn't let it go. He said, did everybody hear her? Did you all? She can play. Did you hear her? Play us another note, Penny. We heard you. I thought, I'm thinking, in high school, you had to play an instrument to be a majorette. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, I'm not going to be back in here next semester. Because <laughs> uh, music was a little hard. But anyway, um, I was loving the FSU Band Association. All of it. Every bit of it. And went through two more years. Uh, tried out for captain when I was the end of my sophomore year. So I was going to be the captain my junior and senior year. One thing I, I wanted to mention was in our high school at Crestfield, the biggest thing in life was to go to FBA District Festival. It was not called MPA. It was the District Festival. And if you were good enough to get a superior, you got to go to state. Now, different things are, are big deals to different people. To us in Crestview, a band town, when the Crestview High School Band went to Tallahassee or Gainesville for state, it was a big deal. Likewise, for me as an individual twirler, as well as playing in our concert band. And, um, and that, that kind of fits in with when I was a junior. And uh, Dean Mann had left Crestview and gone to Taylor County High School in Perry. And he wrote me a letter. And it said, I have nominated you to become an FBA adjudicator. Um, congratulations. Well, interestingly enough, the man that wrote me a letter and told me I was to be a judge, Lewis, many years later, and probably about 35 years ago, no, about 30 years ago, mailed me a copy of that letter telling them that I was an FBA judge. So uh, Dr. Whitcomb came to me and said, um, so you're a new judge. We're flying to Pensacola in two weeks, and you'll be judging. I, he'll be judging something, and, uh, and I'm thinking flying. I've never been on an airplane in my life. And so we did go there. And while I'm judging, scared to death, no training, learning on the job, I see him standing over to the side with the runner. And I thought, there you go. I've messed it up. Wonder what I did. He's come out here to tell me, you, you screwed it up, Penny, or something like that. So the kid comes over with this note, and it says, Penny, drops, don't forget, drops count off, wit. Now, I still have that note right in the top of my jury box. I'll go to the grave with it because I, it was just, it really did relax me a lot. And then uh, after we got back to Tallahassee, he said, now we're going to Jacksonville. And uh, that time I flew and he drove. And I will tell you, if you've ever flown from Tallahassee to Jacksonville, the plane, we were in the air, and the seatbelt sign went off, and then within five minutes it came right back on, and I thought, there you go. This is, something has happened. So I tapped the man in front of me, and I said, sir, could you tell me why the seatbelt sign's back on? And he said, yes, we're starting to land. <laughs> anyway, very embarrassing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's kind of how I got started judging with FBA and, and uh how I really got involved with teaching because, uh, again, Dr. Wickham said, I think you need to teach the summer band camp twirling. And I taught it my junior summer, and then the senior year, they asked me if I would direct it. And I'm happy to say I went back for 34 years and did that every summer, often co-directed it with the girl who was captain before me, Linda Bean Brannon, and loved every minute of it. And then we were down to about 70 kids, and FSU Music Camp wanted to expand to junior high. It was called junior high then, not middle school. And they needed our space. And so they said, would you be too disappointed? And I said, no, if that's what you need to do. I, I would have kept going back. I'd still be going back today because I loved going back. And then, um, and was it 1972, you started your own camp? Exactly. I had learned how to direct a camp. 
and I had attended the Auburn camp, so that had been very helpful. And there was no camp in Central Florida for auxiliaries. I started with 55 little baton twirlers. Most of them were my students and um, loved Ecker College setting. It was perfect. It was safe and small. And then it grew and I added drum majoring next. And then it grew more and added leadership and then percussion. And uh, had wonderful staff. People still say to me, how come your camp is so successful? Well, it's the staff. I just hired the very best people I could find. And um, Rowanna and Phil were very helpful to me in the beginning of the camp. Very helpful, always. And uh, I, as you know, PL, I uh, directed the camp until a year ago when I began to feel I didn't know about uh, spending three nights with teenagers and the stress of all year getting ready for it. It just seemed like I had retired about 10 years before that, that I really needed to retire. And so I did. Well, it's an, it's an amazing career in, in running a camp. So congratulations on your retirement for that, too. Thank you, P.L. Um, well, let me ask you a, a question. Um, maybe uh, as challenges of that you might have experienced as being a baton twirling instructor. Well, one of them was, you know, I had three young children and a husband, and um, I uh, just try. And my business was growing because I had opened Penny School of Baton Dance and Gymnastics, and it was quite a challenge to have it grow and uh, be teaching also and try to be a good mother and wife. And on that note, I have to mention that I married my high school trumpet player boyfriend. He was uh, going to go to uh, the Air Force Academy, got accepted, and, at the, and in May, just before he was supposed to go, he failed the eye test. They said he had a blind spot, and you can't fly if you have a blind spot. So he went to Vanderbilt. And... Um, Interestingly enough, he tried out and challenged for first chair, first trumpet as a freshman, and he played first chair, first trumpet for all four years. And he would love to tell you about the good times they had because they got to go to the Kentucky Derby, yeah. the band did. Yeah. And now then, I think they use the Louisville band, University of Louisville. But um, So anyway, I had gotten married. I kind of left that part out. We got married after college, year after college and moved to Central Florida where he took an engineering job for Honeywell. And I started work as a social worker. The Clearwater Band Director and the Largo Band Directors called me and says, Dr. Wickham says you're a good little teacher. How about teaching our twirlers? And I said, oh no. Put away childish things. I'm, I've got a grown-up job now. I'm doing social work. Well, working for the state, I had aid to the blind aid old age assistance and aid to dependent children. It was hard work because you were in the field visiting all these people and it was very depressing compared to teaching baton twirling. So after a year I called up uh, those band directors and I said if you still need me I, I could do it. I, and then the junior high band director called and then I just started teaching a lot and it just grew because a lot of young women who had twirled in high school now had daughters, and they wanted them to have that experience. Now we get back to the question you asked me about the challenges, and I mentioned uh, full-time business growing versus trying to be a good wife and mother. The other challenge was when the band directors decided that uh, they that flags were more visual, and we don't need baton twirlers anymore. Well, there's probably a generation and a half or two generation of baton twirlers who were dying to be in the marching bands as their mothers had been. And uh, for me, that was really hard to accept. And I, I did try to explain to the mothers and the daughters, a flag is more visual. And in my personal opinion, much easier to get eight flags in pr precise than eight little baton twirlers who maybe they've had lessons and maybe they're, maybe they're home taught to try to get them in sync and make them look perfect on the field. It's harder to do that. And then the fact that I think band directors realized they needed a sponsor for these flags or their dance line, but oftentimes there wasn't a baton teacher. So you have the band director having to deal with the twirlers and any issues they had and their mothers. Now, 
band director's already got a big job. That's something he doesn't need. Get a good flag instructor in here, and if you've got the right person, then they're asked, that flag's going to be an asset. They're a great backdrop. They can add to the visualization of the show. And I spent a lot of time explaining that to mothers. And um, then the other thing was what happened in my area was my twirlers were well trained. And uh, so when they went, they wanted, and I encouraged them to be in the band, join the guard. Well, oftentimes they let them twirl one number and then turn them into a flag, and they all became captains of the flags because they'd been trained for five years, and the other kids didn't even know how to march. I love that at Clearwater High School, you, you know, your band week, your band camp. At the end of that first week, we want everything to do with marching because my kids were in a marching group already, and the freshmen, the gunky band, they, those kids just learned half of them couldn't play their horn and stay in step because there was no... At that point, there were no junior high or middle school bands marching in our county. So, anyway, that was one of my challenges. Okay. Converting majorettes into flag uh, personnel, auxiliary. In your career, were there any pivotal moments that brought you to your teaching success? Um, trying to think what the most important ones would be. Maybe that was when I decided, yes, I, I, yes. Uh, I had a student that I had been teaching for several years, and I had pretty much taught her the material that I knew, and I thought, well, I need to bring somebody in here that knows more than myself. And I had been getting a twirling magazine since I was about in the eighth or ninth grade. And interestingly enough, the girls that was winning national, I didn't even know there were contests until I got the, the magazine. And the girl that was winning was exactly my age. Well, I just called up the National Baton Twirling Office and got her phone number, called her, school teacher in Gary, Indiana. And I said, do you do clinics for twirlers? And she said, yes, I do. And I, she said, where do you live? I said, uh, Clearwater, Largo, Florida. She said, oh, I'll be there next weekend. <laughs> she said, Florida for Gary, Indiana girl was sounding real good. <laughs> she came in for me for 30 years, usually three times a year. And then I had these groups called uh, Dance Twirl. And I, same thing with that. I thought, I need the best choreographer in the country. Well, I found one of the best, maybe the best to me. Um, she was in Maryland. Her husband was an engineer there. They then got transferred to California. And she came in for about 25 years and uh, choreographed some of my material for my groups. And then I had a third person that came in named Candy Campbell, and she had been the Syracuse University Orange Girl, great baton twirler, and incidentally now owns and runs the second biggest baton twirling company in the world. Twirling Unlimited is the name of it. So that's kind of, when I got those people to come in and help me, it just moved my program to a whole nother level. And uh, I didn't know much I didn't know anything about competition except that at the Auburn thing where you got out there and twirled and they pulled somebody out and then at FBA when you did your solo but I had not in Northwest Florida we didn't have contest for twirlers so I was kind of learning on the job with these clinicians helping me out so that's that's how my career really took a turn is there one thing about your personal character that you would say enabled you to achieve your high level of music, musical excellence? Um, as far as teaching is concerned, I always liked people and I loved children uh, and I always wanted to make them realize that they were good at something, they could get better and just to feel good about themselves. and. Uh, I seemed to be able to do that even when I was teaching in high school. The kids loved it and and also from a personal experience, twirling a baton, moving with music, I found exhilarating. It was just made you feel good. I guess like the runners now, they say they run and they get the endorphins and they feel great. Well, certainly twirling a baton is probably as good an exercise as a girl could ever get because you're not just running and using primarily your legs and your abs but you're using your arms and you're just using your whole body 
and uh, I uh, enjoyed seeing people feel good about themselves. And a girl that starts at one level and gets better, and this is true in music also, anybody that improves, that, that feeling of, of a good feeling about themselves is worth, I think that's the most valuable thing you can give anybody. I think that yeah. is, is really important. Yeah. Um, what concepts do you have to instill in your students in order for them to achieve success i know you were just talking about you know the concepts of feeling good and right good. Uh, they have to be taught what practice is kids don't really know okay so practice that's 15 minutes on the horn or 15 minutes on the baton well i learned from the clinician i brought in anita mcdonald from gary indiana when she was winning nationals when i didn't even know what it was and we're the same age uh what practice is all about uh and I'm sure, as a band director, PL, you know what I'm talking about. They have to, doing it one time, or 10 minutes doesn't do it. The guy, it's like they used to say, Jack Crew used to say, the guy that hits a tennis ball is the most going to be the best tennis player. The guy that blows that horn the most is probably going to be the best horn player. The same thing is true in baton. Plus, when baton, um, you've got to do, practice it, repeat it enough that the muscles react instinctively. Uh, they they don't you don't have to think of everything it just comes automatic so that is something I tried to teach and I I think I was successful at it because I have so many students who've been successful business women mm -hmm. and they all I, I, and I say this without reservation every one of them I, I believe has come back to me and said you know Miss Penny I really appreciate you you making us practice hard and teaching us how hard we had to work to reach a goal. And on that note, I believe in positive reinforcement. I, I, I didn't even use that much negativity in my teaching. I didn't have to. And um, I just found out that telling a person that this is pretty good, we can get it better if we do it, and they believed it, and it works. Yeah. So those are the things that work for me. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do in order to keep your edge, to keep the passion flowing? I judging. I think judging did that, and uh, I, I had joined the, joined the National Baton Twirling Association as a young woman, and I judged literally all over the country, and um, then of course the judging in Florida, and and even now in retirement, I'm not traveling a lot judging anymore because I was judging the Miss Majorette of Georgia contest not too many years ago. And it was on a Friday night, and we were picked up at the airport, another judge and I, and they were driving us, we were going to stay at this lady's house. And we're driving through this neighborhood, and everybody's out grilling all these, and I'm like, what am I doing here, you know? And then I judged the Miss Majorette of Texas to top it off, and we thought we were all going home on Sunday. Oh, no, it was cheaper if they flew us out on Monday morning. So then we had to waste a whole day of your weekend with your family. And um, so I, I decided I don't think I like this uh, this judging out of state. And then when you're the Miss Major in Miss Minnesota, the girl that had been winning it for years and years and years comes out in front of me and totally blows her routine. She gets like third or fourth. <laughs> and that day I thought, you know, <laughs> and, I, and her teacher was a lady that had hired me to come and judge. And it, I thought this couldn't happen. She's getting fourth. There's no way with the penalty she's got. And, I, and again, I thought, I think I'm over this going all over the country judging. <laughs> but I enjoy judging in Florida. Um, do you have one short story you would like to demonstrate? Maybe your satisfaction or cho choosing your life as a baton teaching uh, twirling instructor. Or maybe, you know, some, some well, kind of highlights of teaching. Well, I think the highlight, well, it ties in with... Uh, Dr. Wickham at FSU, uh, when I was, because this has to do with teaching, sort of. When I uh, was a senior and the last game, now it's the Florida game. Back then it was the University of Miami game. And he said, Penny, this is your last game. I would like uh, to take you out to dinner after the game. And uh, and I, I would like you to meet Dick Mayo. Now, he, I had never met Dick. He, had, Anyway, he had been the drum major maybe four years before I got there in Dr. Wickham's first tenure there. 
because he was there four years, and I think I came in the second four years. So we did, went to this fancy restaurant, and it was he, Charlie Carter, Robert Barnacle, <laughs> and Dick Mayo, and I hadn't even turned 21 yet. I was still 20 because it was in November before I turned at the end of the month. And I, it, you say I wasn't teaching that night, but it was a highlight of what my, where my mm -hmm. teaching had mm -hmm. taken me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're sitting there, and they, they're ordering these Manhattans, and mm -hmm. they ordered me a Shirley Temple. <laughs> and it was just one of the highlights of my life, actually. And uh, I kept thinking, I didn't know how much, of, how many of those Mar those uh, Manhattans they could drink before, or how we were going to get back to the hotel, right? <laughs> but it was a great night. And, yeah, uh, highlights of learning too. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and highlights of feeling kind of funny because I didn't drink alcohol, and I'm like, well, that's all right. It, yeah. they, they didn't ask me; they just ordered me that yeah. Shirley Temple. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I uh, band directors in my life going back to Dean Mann. And then Irvin Hom, who came to Crestview when I was a senior, and then invited me to come to Gaffney South. He, well, he came to he came to Gaffney South Carolina, then he came to Kathleen Middle School, and uh, he asked me to come up and teach his majorettes, and I did. I, that was right after my senior year, and then Dean had me come to Perry and teach his majorettes, and somewhere along the way I got the feeling that you know I can do this, and uh, I just got to do it well. But as I told you, when I got out of college, I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm done with that. But that wasn't true, thanks to Dean Mann, Manly Rickham, and Irvin Hall. Wow. wow. Well, I have uh, one more question. So what do you do now in your retirement to keep your creative juices flowing? Well, I uh, play a lot of bridge three times a week. I think that's a lot. I read a lot because when I was teaching... I would not allow my staff to stay up late and read because uh, when I came home from teaching, I believed that you should always, always keep notes on your groups and your individual solo lessons so that you planned what you're going to give them the next week. I learned that on the job. If you didn't, you didn't make any progress. So I didn't read a lot, and, but I do now. I like crossword puzzles and I like planting flowers in my yard. And then I have a 21-year-old grandson who's a junior at FSU that I like to visit, and also um, I have a new baby granddaughter from China in New Jersey, and I'll be visiting her. And then uh, I didn't mention that Jim and I play bridge together, so that gives us something to do, and we come to the lake, at which point we go to the villages and dance on Saturday night, so that's what we like to do in retirement, PL. Well, do you have any final thoughts you would like to share with us? Well, let me think about that. Uh, I can tell you a couple of honors that I got that I especially appreciate. One being selected for the Wall of Fame for the band alumni at FSU. And then the marvelous Paula Thornton and Vicki Nolan nominated me for the Music Award through FMEA. That was in 2008. It seems like yesterday, but it was 2000. No, it was 2009. And then... Um, Standing at the FBA meeting last year, not this year, in 2013, and being in that room, the second longest FBA person, uh, John DeLong, being there. That year he was 58, if I remember right. I was 51, and Jerome 51. There were two of us, actually. Wow. And uh, that is a highlight of my life. And uh, I was so proud standing there. That, that, that's it, Phil. That, well, thank you. And we are so proud that you've been standing with us for so long. Thank you for taking time and sharing your stories. But thank you for listening to my story.